Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm late. No, no, no. We will make them. Uh, We'll make them available. Uh, we'll put them on the club website or something like that, and hopefully we'll get the recordings out there someplace. I'm sorry I forgot to start the recording. But uh, Gary, you had a thank question, you. Gary? I'm thanks sorry. Thanks for doing it. Oh, no problem. Yes, I do, thanks. Um, one thing about looking at these models, I think it's also very helpful to see what your wind is actually doing and then see which model at this moment actually matches i mean the trouble with all of these models when you're looking you know these are basically looking at gradient winds and when you're close in shore uh with different ge you know landscape geometries all around you all these models you know tend to fail if you know you're just racing in new york harbor or, or raritan bay versus being offshore where these models you know are much more likely to be accurate but i like actually looking at what the current conditions are and at the trend you know, over a period of time and, and kind of picking a model uh, based on that. So that's, that's kind of my, that's kind of the step into the next, to my next, uh, my next tool. Uh, my next tool is Sailflow. Um, Sailflow will pretty much give you information and it'll give you a basic forecast for anything that's in white. Any little white arrows you could click. It'll give you pretty much what's happening now um for these, these these are historical information that it's re recorded at that site over the day it'll give you a free forecast which is pretty much a basic forecast uh and things like that um it, the, the free forecasts and things are okay um but you can see there's a lot of a lot of sites necessarily where we sell uh there's, there's sandy hook there's one over here on keyboard there's some some of that stuff on the shore there is a, a self flow um, site that is right on the tip of Perth Amboy. It's right there is where that's monitored. It happens to be yellow, which means to get any information for this site, you actually have to pay for self flow. It's the only weather site I pay for just because I can find out at any given moment, right in Perth Amboy, what it's blowing. Um, there is, I, I forget, you know, it's one of those things that I'm on recurring paying, been paying for it for years. I couldn't even tell you how much it is. Um, but there is a discount available if you're a U.S. sailing member. Uh, you can sign up for it. And it's it, it's under $100 a year. It's like $60, $70 a year, whatever it is. But you get Perth Amboy. So you know and find out what exactly is happening at Perth Amboy at any given moment. Um, Kind of before, and it's kind of great to know before you go if you're going down to the club, even just to go for a sale. You want to know what's blowing in Perth Amboy, you know exactly what is blowing in Perth Amboy. Kind of to Gary's uh, comment of, you know, what the other forecast is for a little wider area. Here you're getting Perth Amboy. Um, and when you go to this now, also because I am a paid member, I can get into plus forecasts or a pro forecast. Well, they will give me a lot more detailed information. Um, about what exactly is going to happen where we're sailing uh, than, a, than a broader uh, hey, approach. Frank, quick question. On the cupola, how far off um, the cupola reading is from this site? You know, I haven't checked the cupola reading. Last time I looked at the cups, they didn't look so healthy, so I haven't really looked at the cupola. Uh, you want to see? Let's see. You want to see? We can go to the, the club page right now. Uh, What it's um it's in the about, isn't it? It's on here somewhere. Uh, I thought it was on here. It's, a, it's under sailing. Sailing. Under sailing. Weather and tide. Uh, and it even has sail float winds. I don't know if the uh, link works and if it doesn't sorry my bad oh no for there there was a it did it did work but uh there was a link to the what the cupola one said yeah i think matt brief is here matt <laughs> let's not put him on a spot 
<laughs> Are you kidding me? God damn right, we're putting him on the spot. Kidding. I think you actually have to be logged. I think you actually have to be logged out. Actually, <laughs> but there is there is a link. I will find it and we will post it again. But there is a link to what the, what that little one right there in the cupola will actually tell you. Um, I thought last time I was at the club that the cups looked a little beat up, so I don't know how accurate it was reading. Um, I don't know if a bird got to it or something like that. But we'll check on that. But uh, so. Just to get it back, the cell phone is one of the things that you do. Like I say, I don't pay for many things, but this is it. It will also, like I mentioned earlier, because uh, you are, you can get self, self flow South Amboy tide charts right here. Uh, so you can write down to South Amboy on that same link and that to that same place. So you can kind of get your tide information right well uh, in the same spot here. I did mention that before. I'm not going to get into tides today, but at least you can find them that are right there. Um, so. And then the other, the other general app, and like I said, this could be used for, for this is back to a wider view, um, is, and, and this, this will work for whatever weather app you like. I happen to like the weatherchannel.com app, other people use AccuWeather, WeatherBug, whatever weather, general weather you, you want. Uh, just remember that these forecasts are for a larger area. Um, to kind of get, I use these more for general weather. What's it gonna be? Is it gonna be sunny all day, cloudy? Um, also, what I, what I do like about the, the Weather Channel app that you don't get with a lot of the others is the radar. Um, that you get a much better updated radar map that updates every couple of minutes on Weather Channel than you can on anything else. So especially during the summer, when you're out there trying to track individual little thunderstorms or cells, uh, I find that this, you can kind of get the, the whole play through the two hour window, uh, get a much better feel of what's coming towards us and specifically towards our little corner of the world. Uh, and this is refreshable. It's easy to find on your phone. So I do like this for, for these kinds of things. So those are the three that I use. Um, and we're just really trying to get a good understanding of what's going to change in our little world. Uh, go ahead, Sandy, you got something? Wave. I do actually. Um, uh, if a great app that I found on uh, that I've downloaded to my iPhone is is my radar, um, okay. it's it's free and it basically pulls the exact same vector data from all of the weather stations that go to you know the news for New York. All that it's fabulous. So okay. my radar is a great app to download. Cool. So those are pretty much what I'm going to use for for. Pretty much racing in Raritan Bay. Like I said, feel free to use what you want. Uh, I just find that those kind of give us the best picture uh, of what's going on. So we're going to go back to the, the presentation here. So, oh. Nope. All right. So th these were just other pictures from what was in that. I, I took some, some snapshots here. We're not going to go through that. So now let's get into a little bit of what we're, we said we were looking for. We were looking for what's going to change in our wind. So there's two type of things that are going to, ch the, the wind's going to change on us. They're going to have to, there's going to be persistent shifts, which will be a shift that will happen over a course of time. Those are kind of what we were looking for when we were looking from hour to hour to hour on those charts. Is the breeze going to stay in one spot or over the course of the two hours, three hours, you might be out racing. Is it going to start at North and end up, East. Um, persistent shifts will greatly change how we approach a race course. Um, we'll get into the, what happens and, and how a persistent shift affects us a little bit more, but just want to get some of the technology down. Um, and then you have your oscillating wind shifts. Wind is not steady. Um, the wind is constantly changing direction. And in most cases, depending on the wind direction, the wind actually will oscillate in somewhat of a cyclical nature where it will kind of flow to one side and it'll generally flow back to some kind of a middle number and then flow the other way and then generally flow back. And for certain breeze types, you can pretty much chart those oscillations. And if you can chart them, you can put yourself in the right spot on them and you can go very fast up a race course. Um, just, what the things that do kind of change uh, and these oscillations will kind of be driven by our wind direction. And, and these are some generalizations. They're not 100% hard truths, um, but in our corner of the world, and, and this is kind of for our bay, 
Uh, when we have a northeast, northwesterly breeze, breeze blowing down over the over Perth Amboy, breeze blowing down over Staten Island if you're a little further out. These wind directions are generally caused because we're on the northeast side, we're on the, the, the side of a low pressure system that's going to drive these winds is generally unstable. So they're going to create some unstable winds for us. So you're going to see um, quick changes in direction. You're also going to see quick changes a lot of times in strength. You'll have very puffy or conditions. Uh, and you will get large shifts. So you can see, and when we're sailing in northeast, northwest in conditions, um, you'll see 30, 40 degree wind shifts hit you immediately. And hopefully you don't auto attack and keep your crew out of the water. Um, generally, you'll see changes, the big changes in direction will come with a change in strength. So you'll see if you get a big puff, we expect the big puff to be in a different direction than what you're experiencing now. So it, it, you're going to watch your water, watch your puffs. You're going to stay on your toes because things are going to change rapidly. Um, you also are going to want to um, tack and take advantage of these things a lot more frequently because they don't last very long. A, a puff and a shift might last a minute, 45 seconds. Um, so things are going to change rapidly. And you also, it's very hard to see. I mean, you could have two boats sailing within, you know, 50, 60 yards of each other, and they could be experiencing different things because the, the, the weather is so volatile. So it's hard to look at another boat and say, oh, this is going to happen because things are changing so rapidly and in just short periods of time. So um, that's our kind of northeast, northwesterly kind of conditions. As the breeze comes around east, east to the south side, um, our east breeze is like rock solid, is one of our steadiest breezes that we have. So um, things are going to change a lot slower. Shifts are going to be a lot more methodical. Um, you're going to see a lot shorter, a lot smaller shifts. You're going to see variations of five to ten degree nature. They're going to happen. Everything's going to happen a lot slower. Your 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 period on a shift, to get from one side of the shift to the other, it might be eight or ten minutes not you know a minute so th these things we still want to track um but our reaction to, to them are going to be a lot slower because you have more time and, and the, the, the period of the shift and how things are changing are going to be slower so we're going to do um then you have kind of your other general direction just southwest to your west uh, it's going to be a little shiftier than your east to south um that kind of but not nearly as bad as your, your northeast northwest you're still going to get oscillations in a rhythmic fashion. Uh, you might see a little bigger swings. You're going to see that 10 to 15 degree kind of swings in the pressure. Uh, and remember, this breeze for us generally is also coming over, uh, you know, South Danboy, Keyport, that kind of corners of the world um, when we're out in the bay. So as we get a little closer up towards the shores, they're going to be affected a little bit more because they are coming down over land. So. Um, just trying to kind of get used to that. Now, also, it was to talk about persistent shifts and oscillating shifts. They both happen at the same time. So even as a wind might be generally having a persistent shift to the right, it'll still be cyclical and, and oscillate as it does that. Um, and trying to find and time that, we're going to kind of go through a little bit. We'll show you how to do that a little bit more as we go. So um, Basically much, that's what we're trying to figure out with our, with our, with our wind shifts and what's going to happen there in the two different types. So this is kind of a, a repeat of what I talked about the breezes there. Uh, I'm not going to go too nuts, too nuts there. Okay. So just to talk about some terminology we're going to talk about here. I probably already mentioned some of these things, but we're going to go as you go here. Um, so generally when I talk about wind shifts, a lot of times you hear in a boat, go ahead, Sandy. You're muted, Sandy. Yes. You you have a question um, oh. on your chat. Oh, okay. About how to see the shifts going up a course. We are going to get into that in a few minutes. Well, we have different ways to track them in a few minutes and how we see them and do that. So. Okay, I was just trying to be helpful. Okay. No, 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 thank you. I can't, I can't see the chat, so that's good. That If you see something, Sandy, let me know. So, But we will get into how we track these shifts and time them and do things in, in a few minutes. Um, we're getting there. Uh, I don't even know how long. 
spot it for all right, we're getting it. So, so pretty much before we get there, we need to talk about some terms that we're gonna use to, to look at those things. So uh, I'm not gonna go too crazy here. So pretty much when we talk about shifts, most people use the terms left and right, and that'll be pretty much as we look upwind of the course. Um, there's more technical terms for it, with wind being wind backing or veering. Uh, a backing wind is pretty much, well, a breeze will kind of move to the left. It's kind of like backwards to like the way a clock goes. And a veer wind would pretty much go to the right. If you're looking at a compass heading, you, your compass heading will be going in two different directions. Um, and then we're pretty much going to talk about what's the wind shift going to do to us. Is, is the wind shift going to be a lift, which pretty much will move the wind direction aft on our boat? Well, pretty much, if you would think about it, if you're sailing upwind, it would like lift and push you up and lift you up towards the mark or a knock or a header, uh, which pretty much moves the wind direction forward in your boat, which if you were sailing upwind would pretty much push you down or knock you away from the mark. So it's kind of one of the terms there. And that's, those are the terms we're gonna use as we go here. Um, so pretty much, this, these are, we're gonna talk about this and you're gonna see these numbers things talk about a lot. So. A lift, if you were tracking your heading on a compass, um, and if you were on starboard tack, uh, and the number goes up, so you're sailing along the windward, and you're on starboard tack, and your number goes higher, so you're sailing at 90, and now you see 95. That means you were on a lift if you're on starboard tack. If the number goes lower on port tack, if you're on port tack, so you're sailing 90 degrees, and your number goes to 85, you just got a five degree lift on port tack. And it works backwards for a knock or a header. The kind of the old saying to remember uh, is kind of what I was taught as a kid, is port higher header. So if you're on port and the number goes higher, you're getting a header. And from there, you should be able to extrapolate the other kind of pieces. That's kind of my little, what I was taught as a kid to kind of remember what was going on for those. So. Uh, we got a little demonstration here too. So the middle, uh, the middle picture here is we would say we're going to call it mean breeze. It was kind of, if things were balanced and, and this was kind of our um, normal direction, our breeze direction would be zero. We say, we'll say this is true north. So you have our breeze blowing down the page. Uh, if you were sailing upwind at most boats at like a, a 45 degree angle to the breeze, your boat on port heading would be about 45. Your boat on starboard heading would be about 315. If we take a shift to the left and we go to the left side of the page, now I'll breathe blowing 345. So we got a 15 degree shift to the left. You would see the boat on port, the red boat is heading is now 30 and they're pointing up towards the mark at a, at a greater angle to upwind. And the boat on green, the green boat on starboard's compass heading went down, went from 315 to 300. That would be a knock for them. So they got a 15 degree knock. And if you go to the right side of the page, you pretty much the same thing happens. This is but a 45, 15 degree right shift from zero. Uh, the boat on starboard on the green boat number would go from 315 to 330. And the boat, red boat on port number would go from 45 to 60. Port higher header. So they are now headed and their number went up. So that's pretty much what you we, we, we're going to talk about using a compass to track these things. These are the what you're going to see the differences as you see a left shift or a right shift and how they affect you on the same tax. Um, now the same thing applies uh, if you were sailing downwind. So pretty much same diagram. Sorry, my numbers are upside down. I spent about a half an hour trying to get them fixed and. If, PowerPoint wouldn't let me fix them. <laughs> um, so the, the middle picture is the same kind of thing. Uh, you have two boats sailing like 45 degree angles downwind. Say we're sailing asymmetrical boats or, or whatever. We're just sailing downwind at angles. And when you get the left shift, um, the green boat gets a lift. Uh, so the green boat gets a header, I'm sorry. Um, just like they did in that first picture. And their number goes from 210 to 195. The red boat gets a lift. Their number went from 120 to 135. Uh, and then you have the same thing happens out all the way on the right there too. So um, I don't know, did I screw my math up? Uh, I didn't. Yes, I did. This is wrong. <laughs> the 135 is wrong. I just did these before. So yeah. 
that number's wrong. That number should have actually gone up. So if we should have went from 120, should have gone to 105. And this number should be 135. I have them backwards. So I'll have to fix that before I confuse everybody. Let me just do that so I don't, because I'm going to kill everybody. So this is 135. Okay. So port higher header, right. So do that. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Okay. So now when, when we talk about shifts, a lot of people focused on shifts upwind a lot. Uh, but the shifts downwind mean just as much as the shifts upwind. They just happen to happen a little bit slower because you're sailing away from the breeze. And especially all of our people sailing asymmetrical boats, the shifts downwind because you're sailing at angles almost the same as upwind um, mean just as much. And I see people all the time in, in a lot of our asymmetrical fleet to get a spinnaker up, to go around the weather mark, to go all the way over to one corner, jive, and come all the way back and never look at what the shift did um to them up that course uh the, our symmetrical boats or if you or if you sound wing and wing and kind of the shifts will play a little less uh into what's going on because your course your direction to the mark is a lot is a lot closer either side so it's not going to affect you as much but you can just as quickly gain on downwind shifts as you can on upwind shifts so so a couple little more things here about wind shifts before we get into a little bit more. Okay, so you want to sail towards persistent shifts upwind and away from them downwind. So if you think the wind's going to slowly shift in a persistent fashion to the right, and early in that leg, you want to be going right to catch the to get right when the shift is the, the, the is at least affecting you. And when you can tack then and gain on the shift when it shifted most to the right as you move up the leg. Now, the same the principles that generally apply upwind apply backwards downwind. When you're going downwind, you want to be knocked away. So you want to sail away from the persistent shift um, in the beginning of the leg going downwind so that when you jibe later in the leg, you can maximize the effects of that shift later on. So that's the, how you deal with a persistent shift. For the oscillating shifts, you want to be what we're going to call in phase. Now, in phase pretty much means that you are maximizing um, the shift to your advantage, either upwind or downwind. Um, so that you're always, if you're sailing upwind, you're on the lifted phase of the, ta of, the of the shift, and downwind, you'd be on the knocked phase of the of the shift, and that's going to optimize and make you sail a shorter distance up the race course. Um, like I said before, shifts downwind generally happen slower than upwind. Before we get into some pictures of kind of what this looks like, here's a simple little piece of math for you. If two boats sail a mile long upwind leg, and one boat sails in phase, and one boat sails out of phase with just a five degree shift, now five degree shift is a very small shift in breeze, the difference will be about 57 seconds in a mile long leg if you're sailing five knots. Now I'm gonna let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> One for five but degrees. Considering shift. you beat us by like two seconds multiple right. times. Well, Sandy, I mean, like I uh, say, how many, how many races are decided by, you know, a couple of seconds? Um, we, uh, we have races all year long. I'd say, Sandy beat us by two seconds in one race last week, last year, and then the next week we beat them by two seconds. And one in, in a mon, one mile long leg can be up to a minute on a five degree shift. I'm just gonna say that one more time. Um, it means a lot. And a lot of times this will overcome anything else. Um, your difference in maybe a tide from a left side or a right side of a course or a minor differences in other things. You can get your boat in phase, especially if the shifts are bigger. Think about this a five degree shift. Our typical breeze shifts on, in our southwest could be 10 knot, 10 degrees. So it could be two minutes in a matter of a mile. So just think about that for a minute <laughs> before we kind of get there. And we're going to demonstrate that a little bit with some pictures here in a minute. So. Um, so here is two boats sailing upwind, and this is what happens in a half a cycle. So pretty much, we kind of kind of look at this from the don't 
the, the breeze is blowing generally down the page or marks at the top. Uh, and we're gonna start sailing from the bottom of the page up. So at number one, we have a square breeze, okay? The breeze is blowing straight down the page. At number two, the breeze starts to shift to the left a little bit. Okay, so boat two, blue, blue boat two starts to head up the page a little bit more. Yellow boat two starts to head down the page a little bit more. At number three, we're at like the max of our oscillation. So this is the most shift that we're gonna get out of this little mini oscillation. So boat three is again, once more heading even closer to the breeze. Um, boat three on the yellow is knocked down even more. Breeze starts to come back to a germine. The two boats correct a little bit, and then five, you're back. So this is a half of an oscillation. This is pretty much in the breeze blowing in one direction. It did one little jog to the left and came back. Half an oscillation. So in this one half an oscillation, if you look, and I move these boats the same amount as each one, the twist is done each way on the rotation. Look how much further up the course the blue boat is. Not only are they further up the page, they're also closer to the mark. So if you look at the line that goes from the mark down to the bow of five is shorter by a bunch than the line that goes from the mark down to the front of the yellow five. So in one half of an oscillation, you can see what a difference makes in, in, in missing one half of a shift compared to another boat. Everybody kind of, I know that's could be a lot to kind of, oh, chat, 18 people on, we got 18 chats. Sandy, anything on the chat that I kind of, I mean, I mean, I could probably pull up the, oh, it won't show me the chat while I'm, all right, I guess not. Um, so that's what a half an oscillation looks like. And you just see the difference there. So let's look at, this is a full oscillation. So this is, as we do this, and I have some comments on here, we'll have some fun with this in a second. So this is one shift to the left, back to mean, a shift to the right, and back to mean. So if two boats were sailing up this course and one was taking advantage of it properly, is the blue boat, and the yellow boat is not taking advantage of it properly. So if you're sailing up the course on the blue boat, we got number one. So we're at mean. This is our mean number. This is where our, our middle of our oscillation is. Okay, so you start sailing. Lefty starting coming. So that means on, on this boat sailing upwind on a port tack that the compass number went down a few degrees. So they saw the compass number goes down. Okay, now if you've been, as we get onto this, we'll talk about tracking and what your max is. So as you get to three, okay, this is our max left that we've been seeing in our oscillation. So this is pretty much, we're getting the max advantage to our oscillation. This is the lowest number we've seen on port tack on our compass. It's gonna to start to flatten back out. Okay, back to four, so your breeze coming back towards the mean, you get back to five is your mean. Back to mean, now we expect the breeze to start to go right, ready about, which means we're talking because if this is our only factor, we've sailed the first half of the oscillation perfect. Now we know the rest of the oscillation is gonna shift the breeze to the right, we should be tacking, right, as that kind of breeze comes back to the middle. Okay, so you tack. Okay, six, now the breeze is starting to go to the right a little bit, starting to swing right. Good thing we tacked. Uh, max right, we're a little over the lay line, we're a little over the mark, but we know the breeze in the next little bit's gonna kind of come back, so we don't, we, we put it in the bank, as they say, we don't bear off towards the mark, because we know we can now expect that we're gonna get a header and back to normal as we go. Coming back down to mean, mean, so we, we got near our mark, our weather, our, our wind is back towards normal. And there's another little keynote in here, and we're gonna go over some of this a little bit more when we talk about the tactics. Mean, it should go left for the beginning of the downwind. Using, you could use your information that you gathered up here near the mark to know how to attack the downwind. By knowing what's, what, what the last shift was going into the mark, you'll know what the first shift's gonna be coming out of the mark. So it's don't just because, oh, we're making the mark, give up on tracking your wind, because what you find here is gonna affect what happens after you go around the mark. So that's kind of the blue boat sailing the shift the right way. Now, if you're on the yellow boat, and maybe you didn't figure this out as you're going, so, all right, you get a lefty start, we just kind of go through them here. So lefty starting, let's see how it goes. Max left, ugh, Lou is killing us. 
uh, coming back to mean. So now you get to here, now you get the four. Now the shift, shift starts coming back. Now you can't tax. And so now you kind of pinned here so that you try and take advantage of the lift. So um, back to mean, starting to swing our way. Okay, so now you're starting to get a lift. You're on starboard tack, your head and number's coming up. Now you get to where seven is, okay? You got your max lift. But now you're getting your max lift when you're already on, because you didn't take advantage of the shift early. Now you've gotten yourself all the way on the left side of the race course, and now you're getting your lift. Now you really can't take advantage of it because you have to have to go back towards the mark. So by sailing this shift the wrong way, now you almost have to tack and put yourself at an even more disadvantaged spot. So eight, you're coming back to mean. All right, nine, now the breeze is back to mean, and you're going to start getting a lift. But if you look, they're kind of overstood. So mean, and, and then well, usually you have somebody, man, those guys in the blue boat are really fast. <laughs> lift coming, but we overstood. Now, technically, the boats didn't go any different speed. They just took advantage of the wind shift different. And this is pictorially right, done by a graph. Let's look at the difference and how much the blue boats gained on the yellow boat. It's huge. And that was just from one oscillation. Now I know this is kind of exaggerated to, to get over like one leg. And in a mile long leg, you might see two or three oscillations depending on how fast they're changing and, and what's going on. But a lot of time the guy, like I said, it, it's the guy in the yellow boat at nine going, my had a blue boat, it's really fast. They weren't any faster, they just took advantage of what's going on but it feels like they're faster and it feels like you're slow and it feels like you're not doing something right you could have done everything right on the yellow boat speed wise you could have had the best boat speed in the world but if you didn't take advantage of the shift the same way you're not going to be in the same spot um so this is kind of my fun you'll see a couple little more commentaries as we go but uh so this was just what like i said trying to exemplify what it means when you miss one oscillation this is what it means did the blue boat hey, Frank. It properly and the yellow boat didn't. Frank? Sorry. Yes, Jeremy. Um, I think if you look at number three, the model is actually reversed. I just want to make sure there's no confusion. Mm, I don't think so. Should have a little bit more of a knock at three than they do. I did spin them at the same rate, but okay, it's... Shouldn't the three boat be lifted when the wind direction changes as the three arrow shows? And the three... The blue boat? The blue boat, if you notice, I mean, I don't know if you can see it on your screen or not, but the blue boat is headed. It's got a little twist to it from the two to the three. It does turn left a little bit, and then to four, it does turn back right a little bit. Okay. So you're saying, so you're saying from th three to four, there's a bit of a delay. I see what Jeremy's saying. Um, so you're over, saying three to four, of, there's a little bit of delay on the knock. But you could, I mean, just look at the general curve. Right? It's pretty much what you're kind of looking at, and, and you see the kind of the difference. I did twist when I did the rotate all three things at the same time, so they should be rotated the same degree. It looks like the boats are sailing at the same angle to the wind all the way. Um, they are sailing to the same angle to the wind all the way, yes. And, and but, it looks like yellow probably should have tacked at number two and not. So oh, yes. Yellow text it, too. They're probably right next to blue at the top. Yes, but it's kind of demonstrating what the what happens if you don't do it the right way. Yellow should have, when they realized that they were out of phase, should have tacked at two or three and taken advantage of the shift as much as they could. But this is what happens if you don't sell the shift and you just said, oh, you know what, the current's really better on the left side and we're going left because we're going left and this is where we're going. Or, or for some other reason that you had another, what, why you missed a shift that you couldn't sell as well as Blue did. So that's pretty much, again, like I said, this is one oscillation, not a lot of difference, not a lot of difference in, in direction. Um, so the other thing I want to kind of, this, this, and this we're going to go into more um, when we talk about the tactical things, but also, uh, just to give you a little quick little thing of what happens to packs of boats as shifts happen too. So if your breeze is square, everybody's sailing, doesn't matter what tack they would on, we're pretty much be making the same thing. But when the breeze shifts left and you're sailing with a whole bunch of packs of boats that are on starboard, all of a sudden the boats that are on the 
what they call the outside of the header on this score, in this case, the leftmost boat, just gained, even though they haven't really moved forward any, just gained on the other boats to its right. If you just look what they're started to point down that way. So if you think a header is coming and you're with a pack of boats, you want to be on the outside of that uh, pack of boats. And then obviously the converse is happening too. If the breeze shifts to the right, down here the rightmost boat, if you twist all the boats, ends up gaining on all the boats to its left. So you kind of want to make sure you position yourself on the inside of the lift. So just kind of a little geographic thing of what happens to packs of boats as, as ships come in too. So, but we're going to get into this a little bit more on how to position yourself in, in that thing. But this is kind of good to know. That's probably more on lesson two. Um, so, okay, here's a persistent shift. Um, and back to my little boats here. So pretty much what's going to happen in this picture, uh, like I said, the breeze isn't going to come back to, to the middle. This is a persistent shift like we discussed. The breeze is going to go right, and it's going to continue to go right, and it's going to keep going that way. This happens, um, could happen because you're really close to a wind system, could happen geographically, could happen. A lot of times this happens is as our sea breeze dies, our dying sea breeze goes right 95% of the time, unless there's some other influence to it that some system breeze or something that's gonna drag it back left. As our sea breeze dies, and this happens to sea breezes in a lot of the world, it goes right. So most Wednesday nights, if, you, if we're sailing in sea breeze conditions, say we're sailing from like T to R1 or T to R2, um, those kind of our sea breeze kind of conditions by the time we get going around that six o'clock time, it will keep going right throughout the day. Uh, it's still going to have some oscillations in it, but the general gist of those breezes will go right. And we'll talk about that. Like I said, that's lesson three a little bit when we kind of take these in, in and apply it to, to our race courses. But kind of the same thing that's kind of going on here. So a uh, breeze in, in, in one is, is starting to move a little bit. Um, so what you see, I want you to notice is the breeze shifts. It keeps shifting a little bit more. So look how much more the breeze is right at seven as it is one. So just look kind of the breeze, what's happening. Breeze is just steadily going to go in one direction. So um, when you're on the blue boat, and I, now this is a, a kind of a tricky thing to think about. And this is why it's a big deal between identifying if you're in an oscillation or if you're in a persistent shift. And we can talk, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute of, of what to see the difference is. Um, but when you're in a persistent shift, the guy who wrote in the blue is seeing a header as this starts. So at one, um, we're getting a little bit knock. At two, okay, this is the biggest number that we've seen. This is the number we would expect it to if we were tracking our oscillations to start to go back, but it doesn't it goes even more oh we have a new low number now so when you get to both when you get to three this is outside of what we saw before and then it looks like it keeps going even more so now you kind of know that you're in a persistent shift because when you start seeing the numbers in, on three and four these will be outside of what you were seeing before so now you, that's how you're going to help you identify that you're now in a persistent shift so, and you see just kind of the notes here. So even lower, so five. Okay, by the time you get to five, you've hopefully realized that, that now, and now you're gonna talk about, talk about tacking to take advantage of this shift because now you see you've gotten yourself so far up the right side. Um, and this one, you, know, you would imagine a mark being further up the page, otherwise you would attack sooner. I mean, this is just a kind of, don't think of the mark kind of being right in the middle of the page, otherwise you would attack probably at three or four, but uh, picture the mark being further up the course. Um, you would tack now and you'd have this. So now the, the tricky part is when you're on the yellow boat. The blue boat's a little easier to understand because you start getting a header. And if you tack a little earlier in a persistent shift, if you're the right most boat, you're gonna pass everybody to your left. So it doesn't really matter kind of where you're in that um, progression if you do it a little early. Yellow boat's the tricky one because yellow boat feels great. Yellow boat, getting a lift. Ah, oh, one feels good. 
two feels even better. Oh, we're really lifted. Oh, we're killing the guys over on the blue side. We got a big lift over here. We feel great. Three is that three is when you got to start realizing what's going on. I have a new number. This is the highest number I've seen all day, all race from the last leg to whenever I have a new high. Okay. This is the, the and if you can realize it in here, you can save yourself. But this boat obviously doesn't because it just starts feeling better. Four, oh look, I'm lifted even more. Oh, things are wonderful. And and if you and, and it just keeps happening. But eventually, you're pretty much going what they call around the world to the left. And you can never, no matter how hard you try, the further you go, get back. And when you do come try to come back, like when you tack at seven, you're coming back now on such a header that you just get crushed by the pro that went towards the persistent shift. Like I said, it's the hardest one to do because when you're sailing on that yellow boat, it just feels great. Your number's just going up and up and up and up. And it's like, oh, great. The number's going up. Um, but you have to recognize when it changes from it's just going up and it's, this is part of this normal cycle of an oscillation we've been seeing, or this is a bigger change in the overall wind direction. And that's the tricky part. That's... Uh, Stuart Walker who's one of the best tacticians that ever sailed the boat and wrote the book on all this stuff pretty much and it's so hard to do so when you've seen the highest number you have for the day you're getting the best lift you have for the day tack now that sounds counterintuitive it took me years to be able to pull the trigger on that but every time I've actually done it it's paid off it's so counterintuitive so like when you get to three New high, five over range. If you tacked at three, yes, would you be as, uh, would you be, take advantage as much as the blue boat? No, but you would not nearly be as bad a shape as you are if you kept going. That's a hard one. That's just years of experience, but we're going to help you kind of look at that in a second. And it's mostly you got to know about your ranges and what you've been sailing. And if you track your shifts properly, it'll pop out on you when you when you're looking at your tracking of your shifts. So everybody kind of got what a persistent shift would do to you. Okay. Sandy, any general good comments we got to answer? We're good. Okay. All right, cool. All right. So how do we track these things? And this is pretty much what's been talking about for, for the longest time. Oh, go ahead, Sandy, what do you got? You're muted. You're still muted, Sandy. You're I know, muted. sorry, my space bar is not working. The advice okay. I gave everybody at the beginning, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just trying to like watch your chat to make sure, I'm trying to monitor your, your chat for you. Okay. And um, you have a comment about, um, People are talking about velocity, and uh, and somebody was like constant wind velocity, but also there. If you go back to your yeah, chat, we're, we're we're really we're really we're really th this is pretty much straight up wind velocity being pretty consistent. Um, that's that's what I thought. This so, pretty much we're not changing wind velocity. Wind velocities in general will obviously as wind increases you'll sail a closer angle to the breeze or upwind downwind you'll be able to sail a further angle away from the breeze so if wind increases will act as as lifts uh upwind or or knocks kind of downwind kind of they're good as the breeze yeah. drops the same thing the opposite will happen upwind you'll it should appear as a knock and downwind it'll appear as a lift um Though you really can't, I mean, unless there's some kind of geographical difference from one side to the other, um, a shift really shouldn't change much in your velocity. I just wanted to bring to you, I'm keeping an eye on your chat. Okay. No, that's good. Um, just wanted to, but I think you're doing a great job. Okay. So nice. that's... <laughs> So that's pretty much, uh, like I said, velo velocity is important, but uh, changes in velocity over a side of a course, we'll kind of look at that when we look at the chart and the map and the thing of why there might be more wind in one side or the other. But generally over an oscillation or a, or a, or a persistent shift, you're not really thinking about the velocity changing that much. Um, 
sometimes with persistent shifts, something's changing that's changing the wind direction, so it might change the velocity, but up or down really isn't going to affect how you take advantage of it or disadvantage of it in, in the ship. Hopefully that answers some of the velocity question. Frank, some of the discussion was velocity, the definition of velocity versus speed, et cetera. But in your diagrams, correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like the boats are going the same speed. Yes. Uh, five knots, uh, no matter what direction they're going in. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. That, that's pretty much, yeah, we're pretty, pretty much looking at the angles of attack and, and the thing that we're, we're assuming everybody's going the same speed and everybody's sailing to the telltales and at, at their optimal angle to the breeze that they're feeling. Um, the breeze that their boat's expecting. The changes, like I said, changes in velocity really, unless, I mean, you really can't think about why, I mean, why the yellow boat or the blue boat would have more velocity or less velocity. We're assuming the velocity is the same, but we just experience a shift in direction. Like I said, we'll, we'll talk about maybe on the race course between T and R1, why the right side might have more wind or less wind, and we'll talk about that consideration of which direction we'll go. But when dealing with shifts, it really doesn't matter. Because you're assuming that the wind velocity is still the same on both sides of the shift, as it should be. Before you move on, there was another one that said, uh, are shifts less critical in a long, in a longer race, like a lighthouse race? Um, they're even- like, would, you respond, would you respond the same to these shifts in a longer distance race? How do you, how does, how does one, put that into their pocket? How do they address those? Typically, if you're going to be in a, in a, in a longer distance race um, and, and you're generally headed in a one direction, um, you might have to sail through some oscillations because, I mean, if, 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 you're, if the wind is very shifty, you're not going to tack every minute in a, in a 25 minute, on a 25 mile long leg, you just, you'll die before five miles in so um what will affect the distance racing more because you're going to be out there for a longer period of time uh and i'll sell a leg for a longer period will be the persistent shift if you can get on the right side of the persistent shift over a longer leg that'll pay off more than the, the minor oscillations that you see um if your period on your shifts is longer so you, you have an eight ten minute long period uh, and you're doing a longer leg, you can definitely, then it might be worth, you know, making, getting yourself in sync with your oscillations a little bit better because you can stay on attack for 10 minutes and still be in phase. So do you have, so do you have a calculation about if you know that you've got a three mile, um, point of, you know, a, a three mile mark, do you have, um, which is longer than our normal Wednesday night beer can racing? If you have a, a five mile mark or a 10 mile mark, do you have a, a rule of thumb on your, the timing of those shifts? Like if I'm on something for three minutes or do you, do you have any advice as to what it, we would do in those circumstances? It would depend on what you find the period of the shift to be. Is it taking 10 minutes for you to go from your mean number through a whole oscillation left, right, back to your mean number? Or is it taking five minutes? Uh, depending on the breeze. If you're having that big east, you're in a easterly, breeze isn't changing, only you know five to six degrees, it's taking 10 minutes to get through that oscillation. Um, it, probably not gonna try and kill yourself, maybe tacking if you have a longer leg on every one of those smaller shifts. Uh, if you're in um, maybe a southwesterly and, and you have a five minute period between both sides of the shift and you're on a little shorter race course, you're going to probably want to take advantage of those things a little bit more because the shift could probably be 10 degrees and not five degrees. So it, it's, it's adjusting to what you find the characteristics of the shift to be. Um, that's kind of also why I talked about before the characteristics of our typical breezes. Um, if you're in that northwesterly and it's shifting every, you know, 10, 15 seconds or, or every, you know, 30 seconds, most boats that we sail on, if you're in a 30 foot long sailboat, you're not going to talk every 30 seconds. Uh, you you got to kind of learn to grin and bear the ones you can and you can't. 
um, to kind of get yourself. Also, you got to keep you managing the race course. You're managing the boats around you. You're managing what side you might want to migrate to. Um, so the, the shift isn't the only thing, but it's one of the basic things that's not going to really be dependent upon where you are in a race course and things like that. Right. And, and, and obviously, obviously we have current. You have current, right. You can have current, you can have geographic shifts. You can have, you can have other boats coming that you can't tack on a shift. You have packs of boats. You're, you're on a ley line. You're, you're where you're where, where you are in a race course too. So what we'll talk about, how the shifts apply. That's kind of why we did this as a series. We're going to take this information and apply it next week to where we are on the race course and how we use this information to best take advantage of it where we are on the race course. I didn't want to get into too much of keep everybody or just do too much information at once. So this is kind of the, if you know, we got to know about the shift and where we are in the shift. Uh, and that's kind of today. And then we're going to take that and apply it to where we are on the race course and how to take advantage of it. That's kind of going to be next week and then the week after that. So um, that's kind of how we're building on. Hopefully that answers the people. I know you might have to be a little patient to see how it all applies, but today's real goal is to get out of identifying the shift that you're experiencing and how we track it. And we're going to get to how you track it here in a few minutes and knowing where we are in that isolation, in the oscillation, or if we're in a persistent, and then we'll talk about how to take advantage of that later on. First, you gotta identify it. If you can't identify it right, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so since we mostly sell P, uh, bigger PHRF boats, uh, most of our shift tracking is gonna be done uh, using a compass. Um, if you can somehow, or I don't know if most boats do, if you don't, it's probably a great idea. They're small, they're solar powered, they don't require any wiring. You need a compass on your mast that your crew or somebody else besides the guy driving the boat can see. Because um, if you have that, you can train somebody else on your boat to do this for you and give you valuable information without you taking your eyes off the, the telltales or looking what you gotta be looking at to do this for you. And it's a great way to get other people on your boat involved in what's going on. Um, hmm. I do know a couple of people, and, or, or at least, if, even if that's not possible, uh, I know some boats, just, some boats are not gonna be necessarily set up that way or best way. Even if somebody can get somebody the numbers up on the rail so that they can do the math and do the tracking for you so that your brain, while you're driving, isn't trying to do the math and the means and see what's going on in the tracking of your shifts as well. Um, so this is kind of how you would do it on a rail. This is very much what I've bread and butter, what I've done for, you know, 40 something years of sailing is I'd be on a rail and tracking shifts. And this is, this is your world. This is a job. Um, and pretty much using a compass to do it. I've done it. I've done it laying on the cabin sole in three knots of breeze and raced the world with a compass down below even because I had to go sit down below because it was too light and they sent the fat guy down below and I sat there with the compass on <laughs> laying on the bilge tracking ships. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's just part of life. Um, so we're going to use a little example here um, and we're kind of kind of our example is one of our typical race courses, which is we're going to start at T down at that rock pile, then the rock pile, we're going to go up to R1 up towards Matawan Creek. The true direction for that course is 240 degrees. Um, so that would be our head to wind number would be our 240 degrees. So since that is kind of a southwesterly kind of wind direction uh, on any given night, I would expect there to be about a 10 degree oscillation in the breeze from left to right through the cycle. That's just kind of from experience. That's just kind of knowing what the wind characteristics are for that kind of area uh, and what I would expect to see. Um, so as you're sailing along on starboard tack, you should see numbers uh, in the 190 to 200 range, probably with a middle number of about 195. Now this is assuming that the boats are sailing 45 degrees to the wind, which is kind of average for most of our boats. Some of our, maybe our cruising boats might not get that. We probably have some little higher performance boats that might do a little bit better. But as you're sailing up that race course from T to R1, sailing 
in a 240 degree true, you should be able to establish a range of what you're going to see on starboard tack. Now, you're pretty much trying to find an average range. You're looking for like your high number, you're looking for a low number, and you're looking for your mean, the middle number. And that's going to establish a range. So a range, I would say, if you saw, you, you sail up wind for a little while as you sail through your race, or if you go out or maybe a couple of minutes early, put some sails up and sail for a little while before a race, you want to establish your range. So on starboard tack, our range, I'm going to call our range like 190 to 200. That would indicate we have a 10 degree oscillation between our low number and our high number. We have a mean, which is pretty much our middle number of, uh, in our range, which would be 195. Uh, and if we were sailing on port tack, you should see numbers in the 280 to 290 range, um, which would be also an end with a mean of 285. And that would represent, this is a very, very common numbers. And, and if you start to track these numbers, you'll see they come up all the time. They come up every week. <laughs> they come up on, these numbers would show up eight out of 12 races, maybe, that we sail in the summer because we sail in that sea breeze condition, we sail that race course an awful lot, these numbers will keep coming up. And if you get somebody used to doing it, you'll start recognizing the same numbers coming up and that'll be helpful to you in the overall tracking of them. So now the other thing you kind of want to know, so that, that's going to establish our, our range and from our highs and our lows. So that's kind of one of the first things we want to kind of want to know. Now, the other thing you kind of want to know is how long it takes to get from one of those numbers to the other. And that'll give us the period of our shift. Remember, these things are very cyclical usually. So the time it takes to get from 190 to 200 as you're sailing along will be the period. So now technically, if, if you um, can do a little bit of math and you're sailing along, you should now be able to tell where you are at any point, if you know how long it's, it takes to get from one side of the shift to the other, and how big these shifts are, you should know where you are in the cycle. Don't look up at the boat, just look at the, the cycle of the wind. So you got a little left, the middle, and the middle right, and back to the middle. You should know how long it takes to get from one all the way to the left, and then all the way back to the, the in the middle so you should know how long it takes you now to get from one oscillation if you know how long it takes you to get through the whole pattern and you know how wide the pattern is you should be able to place your boat on the curve of the shift at any given moment and if you can do that when you've then factor in um the other factors other boats where you are on the race course what's going on you can take advantage of a lot of things now I know that sounds like a, it's a simplified kind of fact and, and it doesn't sound things, but it, it, it's really just a big ass curve uh, of an oscillation. And it's a time, most of these things are very predictable. Um, in the, you know, this, this, this kind of example, the 10 degree oscillation in that direction, probably looking at a six to eight minute probably period that you'll see the difference go from one all the way to the other. And that, and pretty much you want to know where you are in that curve. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead for a second, but like just to kind of, so we're going to get into this slide a little bit more in a minute, but you could kind of see how the wind kind of does it. These, these are, these would be headings as you're sailing along. Just we're going to, well, don't too much worry about this slide, but you could see how the breeze does this curve and, 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 and changes as you go. And this is what I'm talking about, that oscillation. Now, if each one of these steps was a minute, and you knew at one point you can paint this picture in your head, and we're gonna show you how to make this picture in a minute. Uh, you should be able to know if where you are and what's coming up. So if you were sailing, say like, to, to forget about the numbers, but you were sailing up this curve, up the course as you were tacking back and forth or doing, you could see that, okay, as you were going 192, 195, 197, 200. Okay, so as I went from the 190 to the 200, I sailed for one, two, this is five minutes, this is like five minutes. So we tacked at 190, okay, we're sailing up, we're, uh, we're getting a lift, 192, 195, 197, 200. 
if you know, I, A, I hit 200, I hit the end of my range, so we know it's going to start shifting back. But you can also tell when it's going to start shifting back if you know how long the period is. So you can know if I started at 190, I sell for five minutes. Hey, after five minutes, it should start going back. We'll talk about that picture in a minute. So trying to figure out where you are, if you, if you know the range and you know the period, you can find where you are in the curve at any given moment. Now, what you should do in that spot, we're going to talk about and and how it applies and what you can and can't do and where you are in the race course and the other considerations but trying to figure out where you are in that thing now if you're trying to drive a boat and maybe trim a sail and pay attention but not hitting anything if you're trying to do all of this in your head while you're trying to drive a boat it's very difficult i'll tell you not in my job i drive i'm also trimming a mainsail i'm doing backstay I don't have the brain power to do this on a leg. This is why my crew does it. This is what I have. This is why I have a crew. This is why I have a crew that knows what they're doing. I cannot put enough. There's not enough multitasking going on in my brain to do this while I'm selling up the course. And this is why I said this is very important for some of your crews and stuff to understand. You can have a crew member do this for you, and they can tell you at any given moment where we are in that curve we're, we're heading up you're going to be on a lift for another two minutes and two minutes the lift's going to end and it's going to start to fade and you're going to tack if you can have a crew member tell you that and where you are and in, in, in what's going on and what's going to happen two minutes from now gee then you can use your brain power to take that information the other information that you know the other information you find from the course the other information you get from your other crew who are watching other things and put together how you address every situation you need to know where you are in that curve and it's very hard to do while you're driving a boat like i said it, it's the, the more things you can get your crew involved in the more things that they can do to help you out with and this is a job that you can give to somebody and if they can see a compass it's it, it obviously makes it much easier um it's simple math it, it's not rocket science it's pretty much timing of a curve it's understanding a range, a high, a low, a mean, and how long it takes you to get from one to the other. It's it's really is, it, and I'm, I'm going to out in the boat, it seems complicated, there's water, there's winds, there's shifts. It's simple math. Um, but it's math that you can't do while you're trying to, I mean, yes, if you're in a dinghy and you have no choice because you only got one person or two people, yeah, you, your workload goes up for everybody. Um, but if you have people sitting on a rail, Instead of having them talking about what they're going to have for dinner the next day or tomorrow or what they put them to work. Um, and most of the time you'll find somebody that will do this because if somebody gets good at this, they will tell you where to go and they start driving the boat and you just start holding a tiller. And that's pretty much what I've gotten a sailboat race and, and, and dictate what goes on for a long time. Um, I will tell you this. I, you also, you know, as my, me as a driver, my best job, is sitting on a rail with not touching a rope or, or a sheet or anything, sitting there with my little notebook, a pen, and a stopwatch. I can be more of a deadly weapon doing that than I can be ever driving and touching a tiller of a, of a sailboat. My brother is far better driver than I am, and that's kind of one of the reasons we were successful is that I, he drove and I told us where to go. Um, he didn't. He had very little power to say where we were going to go. If you get people that are good at this, they basically pretty much dictate where you're going to go and the guy driving just holding a piece of wood um it's i couldn't tell you half the times where i am in a race course or rather because i'm driving and i let other people do these things for me so um little note here changes in wind pressure uh will change your ranges so you know as the wind pressure increases like i said before you'll see a higher lifted number on both tacks uh, on as you're going up so if that if you're seeing 200 is like you're, you're seeing 195 is your mean number the breeze goes up you know two or three knots your 195 is probably going to come 198 and it might shift your whole range up a little bit as the breeze dies uh, like happens to us a lot of times on a Wednesday night, the breeze goes down, your whole range will kind of go down a little bit and it'll actually get further apart from each other. Um, so there's kind of what your difference in your wind pressure might be uh, as it will change and affect your range. So, um, okay, so here's kind of what, kind of going over this, I'm not gonna kill us too much longer here, we're about an hour and a half, I don't wanna 
too much information. We're getting there. Um, so use your frames to find persistent shifts. And this is like it goes back to that with the yellow and the blue and the persistent shift. So if your wind pressure is stable and you see your range shift to one higher or lower, you are also seeing a persistent shift. So if our 190 to 200 is slowly becoming 200 to 210, you're getting a 10 degree right shift as you sail up that course. So use your, if, you're, if your range is changing, and I'm talking about both sides of your range changing, like all of a sudden you see in 195, you see in 195, you see down to 190. If, if it stops going down anywhere near 190, but you start seeing 203, 204, 205, outside what your range was, you are experiencing a persistent shift. And then try and take advantage of that best that you're seeing. So if you have a good range, you'll see the persistent shift faster. If you don't have a good range, you'll just feel like, hey, I'm getting a really big lift, or I'm getting a really, and you won't realize that it's part of something bigger that's changing. So um, anytime, like I said, this is the Stuart Walker example. Anytime you see a new number, a number that you haven't seen before, and it's very important to note, this is a clear sign that things are changing. So the first time you see, if you see in 190 to 200, the first time you see 205, you need to know something. Hey, just saw a new number, do a dance, do something, because something's changing, because you're seeing something that's not out of the normal cycle uh, in your oscillation. So, um, and whatever, just announce that to the world if you do see it, because that'll get people's head, it should get people's head turning that something is changing uh, outside the realm of our regular oscillation. Okay. So this is a little on that. I know I've been talking about crews here a lot, um, and you're trying to teach this to people. Sometimes the best way you can at least get people, when you start getting them involved, is just get them to give you the number. Just every minute. Have a, it's not a hard thing. Every minute or every, if it's really shifty, 30 seconds, every minute, have them call out what the compass says. If they can see a compass that, you know, so you don't have to take your eyes off of it. Or if you have somebody, this sort of the, the number starts getting out there and they start getting used to looking at it. And at least then you can do in your head some of it without having to look at the compass and do it, do it out. So it's the first step. Calling out 195 is better than nothing. Hearing nothing is useless. Calling out 195 where at mean because they've been doing a little tracking. Hey, I've seen 195 a lot on this tack. This seems to be our mean. It's in the middle. I've seen a little higher, a little lower. That starts to becoming valuable information that you can get from your crew. And then the ultimate is calling out 195 mean. We should be getting a lift soon because they knew that we were coming off of our low number to the mean will actually get you a lot more invites to go sailing. Because uh, that means you're actually starting to track the shift. And if they tell you it will last for another, you know, two and a half minutes, then you really find somebody that you should tie to your keel and never let go. Um, but that's kind of the, you, you can kind of baby step these things as you go, but you need the information. Uh, and like I said, the best thing you can do, get people involved in your boat, give them something to do. Uh, and then here's kind of a last note, um, and then we're going to talk about some other graphical method. Don't fall asleep on the numbers downwind. Everybody gets so, you know, we, we sailed the upwind lag, we were up, we were down, we did this, and they get to the weather mark, and all of a sudden everybody stops looking at the compass, and the tactics go out the window, and everybody stops um, tracking ships. The ships matter just as much downwind as they do upwind. <laughs> um, especially especially we got a lot of people selling asymmetrical boats now so your angles are still those same kind of angles uh that you're selling upwind but you're also selling them on the downwind leg now just remember you're looking for the opposite a knock is good downwind so a knock is going to push you down away from the wind which will put you on a better course towards your mark uh, lifts are bad and it does work on symmetrical boats too but most of most of our symmetrical boats we sail pretty deep um if you have a masthead spinnaker you're going to sail you know close to dead downwind anyway but then even you still want to track them to keep your boat making sure you're sailing the shortest distance uh if you get it if you sail dead downwind and you get a big lift you're marked right in front of you and you get a 10 degree lift 
And if you jived in that 10 degree lift, you can be headed at the mark again instead of 10 degrees away from the mark again. So don't, they're a little easier to see then because you can kind of, I know I can kind of feel them a little bit better or see them because you have a mark to kind of use as a guide where upwind you really don't. Um, don't fall asleep under numbers, especially your asymmetrical pupil. Get somebody that can do it upwind. They can should be able to do it downwind. Same rules apply. You still have a range. You still have your numbers. You just remember you're looking for the other thing. You want knocks now. You don't want lifts. So, okay. This is a, I'm going to, the pictures I just showed you are going to be the graphical method. I've used this method myself. Um, I don't do it every time because a lot of what the graphs and the, the things that I've actually built, I carry in my book. I wish I had my books on the boat or I would have taken pictures of the actual uh, numbers I had on the book. But uh, pretty much this is a great way, especially for, you, for new people at doing this, to be able to make themselves a picture and it'll show you the whole picture of what's going on and show you exactly what the shifts are looking like. And if you do this over and over again and a couple of similar conditions or you do it over a couple of different things, you can look at the book and you'll know what to expect because you've already graphed R1, uh, T to R1, dying sea breeze on middle of July. The picture looks the same every year. So if you can make the picture, and then you can look at the picture when you're going out or before you start, hey, this is a typical condition. So oh, we look at the book, oh, this is what we're gonna expect. And it'll happen. I know everybody doesn't think it happens, but it does. Um, so making these pictures, I, I, I have a little wet notes book and a pen and they're, you can pick them up anywhere so that you don't have a, a paper. And you also kind of, it's nice if it's in some kind of a small little book um, so that, like I said, you can keep it and review it and it just stays on the boat, doesn't go anywhere. So for this little method here, um, like I said, I've done this myself. I especially do it for places I don't sail a lot in because the numbers and geography and things might change. Like most of my book is not from off of Richmond County Yacht Club or sailing. Most of my books in Annapolis and in other different places, Atlantic Highlands, places I don't sail all the time because um, then it's even more valuable because it's not you know, see the same numbers all the time in your head. So, um, so this is gonna pretty much paint a clear picture. So pretty much the method is you're gonna sail up when, um, this is great to do if you can do it before the start of a race, it, it still works while you're racing. And you're gonna record your compass heading as you see it at one minute intervals. You're gonna write the large, you're gonna write larger numbers to the right of any of your previous numbers. So if you wrote down 195 and now you see 200, you're gonna write it to the right of your 195. If you saw 195 was in the middle of your page and you saw 190, you're gonna write it to the left. You wanna try and do that with some spacing. So if the number you're seeing is five different or, or two different, you don't wanna write it too far over. If you see the numbers 10 different, you wanna make it with a little spacing so that you kind of make a graph. Okay, we'll show you that how it looks in a minute. So before you, and, and when you make a tack, make a line. So just to kind of give you an idea. So this would work from the, from, from, from the top of the page. Like I say, you make a little note. This is July 14th. So you kind of know the time of year. We're sailing Southwest. Our heading was 240. We were in eight to 10 knots. This is something you're gonna see a lot of. Here was our course. Our course was T to R1. So you start sailing on starboard tack. That's what the S is for. We started on starboard. We saw 195. A minute later, we saw 197. A minute later, we saw 200. And then we saw the number keep dropping, 197, 195, 192, 190. There's the other C. And then at 190, it started to come back to the middle. Now I already know, and I have a picture of what my range is. This is the rightmost I saw was 200. The leftmost I saw was 190. It took one, two, three, four, five minutes to get through that oscillation. Hey, I just solved for myself the range of my shift and the period of my shift. Okay, so then it comes back. You get back to 195, you kind of get back to mean. This line, I, we tack, so you draw a line. So you know why the numbers change all the time. So we put a little P, now we're on port. Since we're kind of in this trend, the breeze going to the right. I'm probably going to expect that to continue when we get on port. So that 297, breeze still going right. 
290, okay, 290, all of a sudden I see a change. 288, 285, 283, 280. Oh, I'm seeing that, still seeing that same 10 range over the same kind of period. 285, 282, 285. So you can pretty much make a map. This is pretty much a map of the oscillation. And you can see what the ends and the range are of your map. You can kind of see what the middle of your map is, is your 195. And you can see how long it's taking to get from one end to the other. I know it seems silly that you sit there with the book and a stopwatch and you sit there on a the rail and you, listen, somebody's sitting there anyway. <laughs> Put them to work. Um, make the picture. And once you make the picture and, and somebody makes the picture, the light bulb will go off in their head. So they're not just calling out 195. If you paint it, if you go back and you look at the picture you made at the end of the race or halfway through, or maybe you do it for an upwind and then on the downwind you take a look at it or so, you can start to map the wind so you know where you are at all times in this picture. So this would be a straight oscillation with no persistent. You see, like our, our endpoints really didn't change. It's still within that 190 to 200, 180 to 290. That's just a straight oscillation that's taking place with about a five minute period. And you can, it, it, the map will draw itself for you. It's amazing, you try it and people are like, no, it won't work. I, I, I was skeptical, my brother forced me to do this when I was I'm like, no, I don't need to do this. I know what I'm doing. Make the picture, it helps. Okay, so the second part of the picture, this is same kind of thing, same kind of start. We start in 18 s 240, okay. This will show you, this is going to kind of go, so you go 195, 197, 200. Okay, we're kind of seeing the same things. 190, 200, 293. Now, if you looked at this 293, it's starting to stick out a little bit more out past our 200 to the right. 190, 190. Now, we didn't get all the way back down to the same edge as the 190. We stopped short at 282 kind of graphically. And then you see, we see 295. This map is now showing you a oscillating breeze of 10 degrees, but with a persistent shift to the right. So you got about a five degree persistent shift over five, 10, 15, 20 minutes. You got five degrees of persistent shift over 20 minutes. Now you can time your persistent shift as well. All with the picture. And this picture you'll see on Wednesday nights all year long, especially with a dying sea breeze, you'll see this exact map happen. But until you really make it for yourself, or you have somebody make it and understand it. It's not like you can't also you can't copy mine because it's going to vary a little bit for wind strength. It's going to vary for your boat. It's going to vary for for those different conditions and things. But this will give you because wind's hard to see this. If you can make the picture or get somebody to make the picture, like I said, it's a fairly, all you're basically doing is writing down a number every minute and you're writing it down in somewhat of a graphical form. The numbers to the right. Numbers higher, you write it to the right. The numbers lower, you write it to the left. Not very complicated. and something you could probably teach people to do, but they will make for you, for the boat, for whatever, a graph, a physical picture of what the wind is doing. Invaluable if, well, we'll teach you how to use it later, but if you can get to here and then you didn't know how to use it, it's, 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 it's invaluable. So that's pretty much what I had. So the goal of tonight, like I said, I don't wanna, I don't wanna kill people. We've kind of gone about an hour and 40 minutes here. Um, that's pretty much the goal of tonight's thing was to try and get you to understand the types of shifts, understand a little bit on how to track them, uh, understand what, what kind of they look like when you can kind of map them out and trying the best way to figure out where you are in that in the curve of that shift so sandy is there any i'll well if, if anybody now because i'm pretty much done if you want to ask a question if you don't want to do it just in the comments in the um in, in the comment section just unmute your phone you can ask questions if that's easier now since i'm kind of done with i have one quick comment sure i see a lot of single and double handed racing in our okay. <laughs> Oh, in your future, in our future, yeah. Well, somebody's not busy. Somebody, somebody. Well, go how are we going to? We can't race with crew, most likely. Well, we will. We'll see about that. We'll. Uh, we're still very. We're still very hopeful that that's 
not going to be the case. Uh, hopefully, we can get our sailing program free. Uh, to, to but at least we can do single and double. Listen, this all applies. It applies to whether, whether you're in a boat by yourself with three people, four people. The more people you have, the more likelihood you got somebody sitting there doing nothing that you can give them a job. And this is a great job to give to somebody. Sandy, you're on. If you're trying to say something, Sandy, you're, oh. there, no, yes, no. You're on now. Okay. Am I on? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the beautiful, what I love about what you've done is that for all of us that are sort of like, are we going to launch? Are we not going to launch? Are we going to get a crane? Are we not going to get a crane? What are we going to do? Do we have, how do we, what is our season going to look like? This is phenomenal. You did a great job. We are so grateful. Um, as a club that you're a proven winner and to bring your tactics and give away your secrets and and help us understand um, What you're doing is is fabulous absolutely fabulous. So if we can't sail, let's learn and um, For me, I need the diagrams. I need these I, I need this and this is how I learn and everybody talks in my ear on mojo I'm like shut the fuck up. I need a diagram Give them, thank you. Give them thank a, you for the diagram. Give them a, a pen, a little pad, and a, and a stopwatch. I, I, I try. It, it, they, they, they're like, they, they don't listen to me. But you guys, thank you so much, Frank. This is, I'm so looking forward to what you did. For what's ahead. Uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, the, the goal is, yeah, to, I mean, there, there's there's a million layers to what it, I mean, everybody asks me a lot of time, they'll be like, well, what's the one thing that makes, there is a million things. This sport is full of a thousand little details and a thousand little different things that get your boat to go around fast around the race course, tracking your wind shifts, things, sail trim, boat prep. There's a million things, tactics, boat on boat, boat on course, tides. But this is one of the basic things that, you know, happens, the shifts happen to everybody. Um, and, and hopefully we'll take this and kind of like I said, the goal of the series is to take this. And we're going to apply where we are in the shifts and things like that, how we deal with other boats, where we kind of are, in the, and where we are in the course, and then hopefully we put that together with racing at Raritan. So, hey Frank, um, yes, it's Dan. Frank. Yes. We hear you. Um, hey, so that uh, weather app, the RYC weather app. It's the uh, Davis weather link, and that is hooked up, and it is working. What's it say? Um, it says, hang on. It says it's 46 degrees. It says that the wind is uh, south-southeast at 8. Oh. Pressure 29.96. Uh, that's pretty close. It is working, then. All right, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't got know nine. If you can... I got nine at for the cell phone. The cell phone one's pretty accurate. I got nine. It's southeast, southeast. So that's pretty close. Yeah. So anyway, the um, RYC weather app. It's um, Davis. The D Davis app. I think if I sign out, I I gotta figure out how to like this. What the what the RYC websites. At times. Um, yeah, and with that, I take that personally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it personally. So about to, oh, there we go. So if you go, if you're not logged in and you go about the club, you click on weather, it'll pull it up. There it is, seven east, sixty-seven. But if you're logged in, you can't get to it. <laughs> really? All right, I'll change that. Hey, Ann. I'll change yes. that. You watched the U.S. sailing? Uh, I did. Okay. That's great. What did you take away from that? I bet the group would like to hear. Yeah, give us a report. Well, the, the same thing that we're doing is, you know, basically everybody's trying to prepare. They're trying to do everything they can. Uh, their summer sailing programs are still taking applications. Uh, they're telling people that they will refund it. But they're really waiting for their state um, to actually make a call before they could really do anything. But they're getting things ready. Um, boats are being launched. Uh, they're putting boats at docks, telling people that they have to social distance. Um, they didn't. They. 
they didn't say too much about boats on moorings. They said boats on moorings, big wow, you know? How are we gonna get to those boats? Who's gonna take us there? Uh, somebody did say, yeah, there's a problem with uh, launch drivers and, you know, until we're open, they kind of said that, which is what we know. Um, they were talking about single-handed and double-handed racing and having pursuit races or having, um, you know, race committees starting at the dock, you know, starting like at our cupola so that you don't need a whole race committee to do things. But if you take this football thing a little more seriously, you might play in the NFL. And DJ We're watching the draft. <laughs> Did you? Somebody turn off the damn draft. Turn off your mic. Is that you, Ian? Turn it off. I don't know. I don't have it on. Really, everybody had these tackles in a different order. For me, he was my Yeah, let me, let me, uh. So did you guys hear I'm Unmute everybody, but I'm going to unmute Ann. I unmuted Ann. Okay. All right. And Sandy, I unmuted Sandy. Okay. All right. So did you hear what I said or no? We heard, we heard the most of it. Okay. Basically, the gist is everybody's in the same boat. We all know that. Everybody's waiting for their state to, uh, you know, really do something. Um, they're preparing to do, you know, launch boats and stuff. I need to talk to the board, to Dawn and you guys. Um, you know, we could launch, but, you know, that whole project afterwards you know, the, the launch drivers, the where to put dinghies and all this other stuff is, is a big, big thing. And we, we, will, uh, later. we will be talking to you this weekend about, when you have a second, give me a call or Al, we're gonna need to get on the phone and talk about some of that. One, well, one, question, one question, an aside is that I would like to know, and this is more, you know, this is more club related, but I would love to know how many people with moorings have dinghies. So everyone's saying like, well, we can't deal with 90 dinghies. Well, any of us that have been in the, in the BVI know how to deal with 90 dinghies. You have a long painter and we can deal with it, if, especially if the college kids aren't using that inside dock. But how many people have access to a dinghy? Because that will, that will, that's a question we need to know, right? Because that will, that will decide that's part of our problem. There's a there's a there's a log jam. There's going to be a, a how do we deal with all the dinghies? Who has dinghies? Well, whoever launches their boat, if they're going to launch their boat, either they're not going to get to it, or they're going to end up having to wait until you know the launch drivers are running, or they have a dinghy or a a, a little power boat or something to get to that. Um, so. Right, you know, we, but it's where we, is your dinghy at at that point if you don't already have a slip at the ramp? Yeah, well, well, Linda, there's going to have to be there's going to have to be a, a a pass. You know, like you're not going to have to have a a slip for your dinghy to get to your boat if we can't do launch service because of social distancing, right? Like these these are part of the conversations that we're having as a board, and right. I agree. Conversations are going on. They're, 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 we, we are or, trying. We, I can promise you that oh, we're yeah. trying. I congratulate and applaud you all. It's a difficult situation. I'm on board with, you know, whatever has to be. It's it's really whatever we can do, right? Whatever 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 we can whatever we can do, I can promise you mm -hmm. that as a board, it is our intention to make sure that we all have access to our boats and that we can all get whatever we can out of the season. We are, we are strapped. We are kayak, strangled. We are trying. Out to your boat. I hear whatever. If you have a kayak, get yeah, a kayak. Yeah. Yeah. A kayak. I heard and saw there's a lot of kayakers out there, you know, and you just got to do whatever we got to do. Yeah. But you have to think about safety too. And, you know, people sure. like, you know, need to, have their life jackets and things like this because we're not, you know, we don't have the capability of just going out to rescue. So there's a lot that- But Ann, Ann, in all yeah. fairness, in all fairness, if, if I as a boater have a dinghy to get to my yacht or my boat, 
safety is on me. That is not a liability of the club. It is not. And if you look at your insurance policies, if you look at the club policies, we all, people in the morning, we sign off as a club as, you know, and as an additional insured. 